Hi, so I'm Alan Algazi. I'm using my slides now. Um, I'm Alan Algazi from the University of California, San Francisco, and I'm here to talk to you about the wonderful world of melanoma, which is a really exciting field to work in these days. Um, lots of things are happening, and it's kind of like trying to eat a hippo sandwich. We have so much, we don't know where to start. Um, we've had several major breakthroughs. Uh, the targeted therapy, the idea that we're going to find broken growth, which is in the cancer cell, turn them off, and that will have a clinical benefit for our patients. And then the immune therapies, which Rich Carvajal is going to talk to you about in a few minutes, where we are enhancing, typically enhancing the native immune responses against melanoma, although there's various ways we can go to enhance immune response against melanoma. Those kind of have two different benefits. The targeted therapy typically will lead, in the best case scenarios, particularly in BRAF mutant melanoma, can lead to rapid responses that can lead to tumor regression, symptomatic improvement within weeks. The immune therapies have more durable responses, and so we're working on both ends to improve the duration of response in targeted therapy and to improve the success rate in immune therapy. So I'm going to talk to you about the targeted therapy piece and largely about how we're going to try to increase the response duration in patients with BRAF mutant melanoma. I have a number, number of conflicts. These are typically uh, companies with whom I'm doing clinical trials. So we're actively involved in partnerships with industry working on clinical trials. So mostly I'm going to focus on targeting treatment resistance in BRAF mutant melanoma. I will touch very briefly on adjuvant therapy, brain metastases. This is kind of a paradigm changer, probably both for immune therapy and targeted therapy. Many of our new drugs, unlike the chemotherapy of old, has activity in the brain. And so you may even consider some of these. It's, they're not yet FDA approved in that context, but they're things we might, might come into our paradigm for treating brain metastases. And then the last question is, how do you eat that hippo sandwich? How do you integrate targeted and immune therapy? You have so many things to choose from. You know, how do you manage the patient in front of you? How do you make those choices? So in general, for melanoma, traditionally the treatment had been chemotherapy. And those were drugs uh, were associated with a low response rate in patients with metastatic melanoma, typically 10% response rate, no survival benefit. And those have really taken a back burner in our, in our, in our management uh, most recently. The immune therapy I touched upon briefly, which Rich will tell you about more, and the targeted therapy is really the focus that I was going to tell you about. And when I'm talking to patients, I, I characterize it as follows. There are gene errors in tumors and those lead to broken parts in the cell. Some of those are switches, and those switches are deformed so that they are stuck in the on position. It's like you took a light switch and applied super glue, and you can no longer turn that switch off. Now, we have the drugs, actually what these, the BRAF inhibitors in particular do, is they bind to the ATP binding pocket. As we know, that's how the switch gets its power. So it's like we're cutting the power to the broken growth switch. And by doing that, we can stop that signal. We can make it so that broken growth switch does not send its signal. And that, when we do it properly, can have an enormous benefit for our patients. So there's a lot of circuits involved in melanoma. And this is actually a gross oversimplification. And this is the way we would sort of think about it a couple of years ago. We knew there was more to it than this. But this just sort of highlights some of the signals we've been targeting. BRAF is a, a, um, a serine threonine kinase that's mutated in about half of melanoma patients. Typically, uh, in patients who develop melanomas on their torso may have more BRAF mutant melanoma, younger patients, and um, that's where I'm going to focus most of this talk. Uh, a lot of these patients also have lost signaling through a, a tumor suppressor called P10, and so sometimes we think that those two pathways may work together to cause cancer. And in fact, in a BRAF mutant setting, you don't always get cancer. It turns out many benign moles have BRAF mutations, and they never turn into cancer you need additional cooperating mutations to do the job. So we think BRAF and some other pathways may be involved. There are about 10 to 15% of patients who have mutations in a, a kinase called NRAS, and those are typically, at the time of diagnosis, exclusive from the BRAF mel mutant melanoma patients. After being treated, BRAF mutant melanoma patients can develop these NRAS mutations, but before they're treated, it's, it's less common. And then there's mutations in receptor tires and kinases, such as CKIT, particularly in mucosal melanoma and acral melanoma. So, Vemurafenib was the first FDA-approved BRAF inhibitor, and it binds to the ATP binding pocket of BRAF. When in those patients who harbor a BRAF mutation, it can induce dramatic tumor responses in weeks. So if you look at, this is a patient at baseline, and at day 15, the PET response has been dramatic within two weeks, which is kind of unheard of in a lot of cancer therapeutics. And if you look at the radiographic response below, you can see that these liver metastases have really shrunk 
incredibly, it really, really diminished incredibly within two months. So these are the rapid responses that I told you about. And so here's a, the waterfall plot from the uh, vemurafin of phase three showing how many patients responded. And compared to chemotherapy, um, it it's, was 50% response. And the vast majority of patients had some tumor shrinkage. Whereas with the chemotherapy, the vast majority of, most of the patients actually had tumors growing. And they typically progressed within a month or two. So the main problem with vemurafin is how long does that last for? The median progression-free survival with the drug is 5.3 months, which is not a huge number. I mean, within six months, your patient is going to need some other kind of therapy. And why does this happen? And if, so if you think about it, you start with a large mass of tumor, and you see a major debulking. You see shrinkage of tumor. And you see this waterfall plot, and you say, wow, that patient had a 70% reduction in tumor. That's terrific, except there are billions of cancer cells still in the body, and they're genetically unstable. And now they're living under the selective pressure of your BRAF inhibitor, which you're dosing continuously. So if you think about Darwin, evolution of species, um, it described the whole process of natural selection. You know, if you had the finches in the Galapagos, if they were having, under certain uh, selective pressures, the ones that would survive and reproduce, it's sort of analogous, more of an analogy than a one-to-one -one correlation. The ones that would survive and produce, uh, reproduce are the ones that had certain adaptations. So for instance, there would be um, finches that were living in a place where fruits were abundant, and their beak would be adapted for that particular environment. Other ones would feed on leaves, and they have a very different beak structure. So there's, a, there's a, a change. The tumors do something very similar. They will change and adapt to that environment and develop resistance. And the ones that grow and survive are the tumors that develop a, a, a mechanism of resistance. Well, one of the beauties about doing targeted therapy in melanoma is that we're doing a very focal intervention. For instance, vemurafenib and dubrafenib, the BRAF inhibitors, they turn off one growth switch fairly selectively. They don't do a lot of other things in the body. And so we're able to probe what happens before and after with that very focal intervention, contrast it to chemotherapy, where it may be causing a myriad of mutations and errors, and it may be very difficult to quantify what happened after therapy. We're able to go and probe the tumors and see what happened. One of the things that seems to be happening frequently is that the tumors will learn how to evade that blockade and reactivate the very same pathway. They reactivate the MAP kinase pathway. Typically, they'll turn on a protein called MEK downstream. The BRAF kinase doesn't change. It's not like there are new mutations happening in the BRAF kinase. They find a way around. Initially, this was thought to be mediated by escape pathways. There was a variety of proteins that seemed to bypass um, the BRAF growth switch, CRAF. There was a protein called COT. There may just be an increase in the BRAF protein level, which I'll talk to you about later. But one way or another, the tumors were reactivating the MAP kinase pathway downstream. This happened in about 70% of patients. And so there was a thought that if we do a combination therapy, we could actually turn off two growth switches in the same pathway. And so the idea of combining BRAF and MEK inhibitors was born. And the MEK inhibitor uh, is, has about a 30% response rate as a single agent, 20 to 30%, BRAF 50%. When you put them together, it did two things. It increased the response rate of the combination to about 70%. And it increased the progression-free survival from about six months to about nine or 10 months. So there was clearly a significant clinical benefit here. And the other thing that's also interesting about this is they offset each other to some extent in with regards to toxicity. So there are certain kinds of problems you get with the BRAF inhibitors, such as new skin cancers, squamous cell cancers, and the incidence of those is far less because they offset their activity. I can go into that in detail, but it's beyond the scope of today's talk. I'd be happy to talk to you about it later if you'd like to hear about the story there. And this has now been borne out. The, the, the increased progression-free survival with BRAF inhibitors has been borne out in phase three testing. There's been a randomized phase three trial of dubrafenib and trametinib. That's a BRAF-MET combination with vemurafenib, which is a prior standard of care, showing a four-month increase in progression-free survival. And the overall survival appeared to be better, although patients tend to live a while on these, you know, because we have second-line therapies and other things that are effective. So this is the idea that we are able to do a focal intervention. It's already a benefit for our patients. You know, if somebody comes in symptomatic, can actually get better pretty quickly and feel better and function well with a favorable side effect profile. But we're also able to probe the system and understand what needs to be done to improve on that response. This is a second combination of a BRAF and MEK inhibitor. This is now vemurafenib plus a MEK inhibitor by Genentech called cobimetinib. And those two drugs also show a better PFS than one drug alone. 
So BRF plus MEK in an unselected population shows an improvement in progression-free survival, and, a, and it looks like an improvement for overall survival as well. So for me, for BRF mutant melanoma patients, I consider the standard of care to be a BRAF MEK inhibitor combination. I think that's true of pretty much everybody in the melanoma community these days. Uh, and that's actually been a late change. Some of the big Kaiser I know didn't adopt that until just recently. So the issue is, well, okay, now you got your patient in remission for 10 or 11 months. What else is going on? And of course, we know that there may be alternate pathways. It's not quite as simple as that. Um, the example I gave, you know, I, I, was, I, I trained in UCLA, and uh, you know, in Los Angeles, they had something called Carmageddon. They were going to close down the 405 freeway, and it, you know, they said that it's going to be Carmageddon. The whole city is going to shut down, and it's going to be a disaster. So I was down there giving a talk at my old alma mater, and I was going up the 40, 405, and I, I noticed all the buildings are still standing. You know? <laughs> the, the city was not demolished. It was not the end of the world. And what did people do? Well, they found a way around. They took one of these alternate pathways. Instead of taking the 405, they drove through the canyons. They, they took a different route. And I think this is what melanoma can be doing to some extent. So we're exploring some of these alternate pathways as well. And we know that there, there are pathways that are active. If you look at a melanoma cell, look at that bottom panel. They looked at one melanoma cell line, and they found 187 mutations that were actually encoding changes in protein. And so these are potentially very genetically complex. So they may find a way around. There may be other pathways active. One that we've been exploring to some extent, remember I told you that P10 mutations plus BRAF can cause melanoma. Those may work together. So we looked at inhibitor of the PI3 kinase pathway. This is some cell line data showing a, a cell line here on the left panel on the top where there was a decrease in tumor burden, decrease in cell growth up until a certain point. Resistance developed, and right at that T, T point, uh, the cell lines that were switched to an AKT inhibitor started to to, uh, to, to, to die off, as opposed to those continued on the MEK inhibitor, progressed and grew. And here's on the bottom panel, you see some um, de novo uh, cell line work where the combination of a BRAF, MEK, and AKT inhibitor led to massive tumor killing. So maybe one way to prevent adaptive resistance is to kill off a lot of tumors. And so we're looking at this triple therapy combination. Now I've looked at, here, this is basically the diagram of what you're turning off in that scenario. This is with Vemurafin and BKM120. We're also looking at the AKT pathway a little bit farther down, uh, that, a second drug that turns off the pathway a little bit farther down. This is showing some synergy between Dibrafidib and the AKT inhibitor. These are, again, cell line data. And we have a uh, cooperative group trial that's going through SWOG where we're going to be doing dose escalation of all three drugs. So remember I said the BRAF plus MEK is now the standard of care. So we're going to try to find out whether BRAF plus MEK plus AKT will actually lead to improved res results in our patients. It's already been tested. BRAF plus AKT is well tolerated, and we do see responses there. BRAF plus MEK, of course, is well tolerated. And so we're going to see if the triplet is really going to be effective, both in the second line after progression on BRAF and MEK, and ultimately we want to test that in the first line because we think it may, may help to really get rid of those tumor populations so they can't adapt. There's not enough cells to find a new solution to uh, work around our blockade. This is an example of a patient that I treated with a BRF PI3 kinase combination. Um, and there was a, a large, this patient had been on a BRF inhibitor, had had massive tumor progression, and we added a PI3 kinase inhibitor. And here's her groin node circled in red. You can see a massive reduction in the tumor volume. So it can work in some patients, and that's something we're exploring. Another, there's, there's many pathways that are being discussed. This is brand new, hot off the presses. There may be another pathway called the HIPPO pathway, going back to our HIPPO theme for the day, uh, which is just discovered, which appears to be a strong driver of, of, of tumor survival. And it may be that if we turn off the HIPPO pathway, that we may get a better result in BRAF mutant melanoma. So a lot of other pathways are being explored. I just give this as an example. This was just discovered at UCSF and uh, with a lot of collaboration nationally. And uh, now we're trying to find a, a, a something, a hippo inhibitor of sorts. It sounds like a funny thing. I'm gonna inhibit the hippo. Um, it, but there's actually a main protein called YAP1. There's no such thing as a YAP1 inhibitor, but we're gonna try to develop a YAP1 inhibitor to see if this makes a difference. Now the issue then of, 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 the, uh, of this approach, remember we were talking about evolution of tumors. Um, is that we may end up playing whack-a-mole still. Remember how complex those tumors are. We could turn off a number of pathways, but that little mole may come up again, and we may you know, turn off the next pathway, and then that's still going to adapt. 
if we kill off tons of tumor cells, great, perfect. Maybe, maybe it's enough. Maybe it's like CML, where we kill off enough that it's just senescent for a long, long time. But we may be stuck with this whack-a-mole phenomenon, except if we change the milieu. If we change the selective pressure, maybe that's going to be the answer. So rather than doing continuous dosing, and we're, we're thinking about this from the mindset of chemotherapy doctors, right? We've been doing chemotherapy for years, and if you do intermittent dosing of chemotherapy, you're going to end up with a really complex and resistant tumor. That's not always a great strategy. But with the targeted therapies, I'll explain why this could be helpful. Maybe we need to change the selective pressure. So what, one discovery that sort of gave some wings to this idea was this idea that tumor cells, BRAF mutant melanoma, can actually become addicted to the drug. It can need the drug to grow. And so imagine this. You have tumors that have, are developing resistance, and one way they're doing this is just making more of the growth switch. They make more protein. Now, we all know you can only get so much drug into our patients. There's a certain level you can't exceed because it becomes toxic. So they make enough protein so that part of the protein is inhibited, and then they make enough so they can still send that growth signal through. So that's a, an adaptation. Well, what was found out is if you take those cells that make more of the switch and you grow them in a culture media, they hate it. They don't grow well. They die. So if you look at the left panel under resistant, this is increasing doses of emurafenib in these resistant cells. And what you see is the ones without any vemurafenib actually go really poorly. Whereas the parental cells, the more vemurafenib, the less vemurafenib, the better. And you put more and more, and then they die off. But with the resistant cells, there is a certain point at which they grow optimally. There's a certain amount of drug which really helps the cells to grow well. This is despite the fact that you're actually turning off the pathway. It's not that you're not turning off the pathway. The, left, 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 the right panel shows a decrease in signaling in the pathway in both cell lines based on dose. So these tumors, they make more growth signal. They don't they go, more growth switch. They don't like it when it's all on. They want part of it off. They don't grow well when you withdraw the, the drug. And when you withdraw the drug in animals, you can actually see tumors shrinking. These are transient shrinkage of tumors in a mouse model. And here's in patients. These are patients who were treated until progression on vemurafenib. This was presented at Rosalie Fisher at the SMR annual meeting in 2012. And what you see is uh, that peak where it says progression. That's where the scans, that's when they were taken off the drug. And they were scanned after a number of weeks. And the tumors regressed spontaneously. Well, they regressed without any intervening therapy. So there's some evidence that there's a withdrawal effect in patients. And here's a patient that I had in my own clinic. This is not a dramatic one, but you can sort of see that at the time of progression, the tumor was about six centimeters. And it was about five centimeters a few weeks later when we rescanned starting a new therapy on a study. So you do get tumor regressions. This is, this is um, contrary to sort of conventional wisdom. We think you stop treating the tumors grow. We're killing off those tumor cells. But in fact, there was this withdrawal effect making the hypothesis sound more reasonable. And so the thought is, you start out with a tumor that has a BRAF mutation. It's sensitive. You turn off the growth signal, and the tumor dies off. Over time, if you dose continuously, the cells that get the adaptation, the cells that grow back, are those cells that have found a way around, that have made more growth switch. And you start seeing a tumor that's comprised of resistant cells. When you take the drug away, those cells that require the drug to grow die, and the tumor regresses, but then eventually repopulates with the resistant cells again, uh, so as the tumor regresses and becomes popular with sensitive cells, you put the drug back, those sensitive cells die off, but then the resistant cells grow back. So it's like a seesaw back and forth, resistant sensitive, depending on whether you have the drug on or off. When you do this in mice, here's an example in mice. It took, start with the right panel. Actually, you can show that their cells remain sensitive for many, many months. Actually, the animals treated intermittently. Those are the solid lines on the top. They actually retain sensitivity, and they don't die of their melanoma, whereas the animals who are dosed continuously die within you know, a few months. So here is an example in, in animals where intermittent dosing prolongs sensitivity. You can see the tumor size fluctuations on the left panel on the top, where you see the tumors fluctuating in the bottom panel. That's intermittent dosing. And on the top panel, the tumors eventually grow out of control, and the animals will die from an excessive disease burden. The cell culture in the bottom is just showing you that it's even more pronounced in, when you have BRAF and MEK inhibitors. If you, the tumors become with, addicted to the two-drug combination, when you withdraw them, you see profound tumor killing. That's the panel on the bottom on the right, profound tumor killing in a double-drug resistant tumor setting, and a little bit less so in a single-drug resistant tumor setting. So the idea is our standard of care is BRF plus MEK inhibitor. That induces a lot of dependence on the, tu on the drug for continued growth, addiction to the drug, and when you take those drugs away, you actually get death of tumor. 
So we're putting that into a large randomized phase two trial where we're comparing intermittent versus continuous dosing of the two drugs, the idea that we're going to change the selective pressure on the tumor and see if that prolongs progression-free survival. And we've designed a study where you have a lead-in phase of about eight weeks to let the tumors get small before you start taking the drug off. And then we in introduce intermittent dosing when the tumor burden is low. I put about half a dozen patients so far on this study. It's a national study, by the way. So if you have anybody who's a SWOG affiliate in America, you can actually seek out, put your patients on the study in principle. Um, and uh, I think GSK provides drug. Uh, and, 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 and so it's, it's not more difficult than, than doing the standard of care. Um, and so we're going to compare the two arms. You have a lead-in phase. You debulk the tumor. You introduce intermittent dosing. And our hypothesis is that those patients who have treatment breaks will actually do well for longer. We also think they're going to have less toxicity because usually those breaks give a time for a little washout of the drug, and that decreases some of the side effects. So we sort of calculated how long the break should be based on the pharmacokinetics of each drug. We decided it's about three weeks. And this, the bottom panel is just showing you that eight weeks that most of the patients are already in response. So we expect the tumor to be relatively small when we start. And you know, remember I told you the toxicity may be less in this, when we take the breaks. It turns out that some of the big toxicities from the combination of dibrafenib and trametinib, the BRF-MET combination that's currently FDA approved, are fevers. And often patients will take treatment breaks based on fevers. Um, and, and those patients actually tend to do better for longer. There's some data suggesting that patients getting fevers um, may do well for longer. And people have hypothesized that's because of immune activation, but it may in fact be because we've taken treatment breaks. So again, we're testing all of that. We're going to collect tumors to try to understand exactly how that changes the resistant mechanism. So if you do have any patients who go on the study, if you're able to get some biopsy, that's much appreciated. So I'm just going to touch briefly on a couple of more issues uh, in the last few minutes. Um, one of them is adjuvant therapy. And so one of the things that's been consistently seen in the metastatic setting is that patients with a lower disease burden often do better for longer. And it may be that, again, there's a smaller population of cells, to the, and those have less chance to adapt. And so people have talked about moving the BRF and MEK inhibitor to an adjuvant setting, resected stage 3 melanoma. And this just gives you an idea why that's kind of a reasonable idea, because if you look at patients with a stage even a stage 2C or a stage 3C melanoma, most of them will die within you know, 10 years, even with young patients. So if we can intervene earlier, it might make a huge difference. And so um, there, and if you look at the standard of care, this is interferon in patients with palpable nodes. I don't, who's, who's used interferon here? Was it easy? Really tough, right? A lot of side effects, fevers, chills, flu, suicidality. For a whole year of therapy, it's kind of a real tough road. The BRF and mechanisms, I'll tell you, don't cause that kind of side effects. They have some side effects, but they're not usually that severe for most people. This is a trial. This is basically the peg pegylated interferon trial showing survival in patients treated with, with palpable lymph nodes treated with pegylated interferon versus observation. I don't see any difference in those curves, and I don't see if I was a patient that I'd want to spend a year feeling miserable for that. So we have a lot of openings. And there has been a trial, COMBI-AD, which is a randomized phase three trial, Comparing BRF and MEK inhibitors versus placebo, again, interferon is so marginal that placebo is considered to be legitimate in this setting. Uh, and those data, the, the trial's now completed accrual, and those data will be coming out soon, so we'll all be looking for it. And if, you know, if you're in practice, um, keep your eyes open. And if it's a positive study, that might influence some of our treatment decisions. Of course, I don't have the data. I can't share any with you at this point. But it's, it certainly could be something that would be uh, provocative. Another problem we have is brain metastases. And you know, traditionally with melanoma, we've treated brain metastases with radiation therapy. Uh, whole brain radiation for patients with multiple metastases, uh, stereotactic if you just have a few. And we've given chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy didn't have any activity in the brain, so there's no point in you know, relying on that as your modality for, for treatment. Brain metastases are extremely common. This is a huge problem. If you can, uh, uh, about, you know, the vast majority of patients will develop brain metastases at some point in their treatment course. Um, and it's typically associated with a poor prognosis. Here is a study uh, that I participated in showing the effect of dibrafen of the BRAF inhibitor in patients with brain metastases. This is the waterfall plot for the brain metastases. And you can see there is a high rate of response in the brain to these drugs. So they actually get to the tumor somehow. They don't cross the intact blood-brain barrier, but it may be disturbed. And so these drugs as a single agent have a, nominally a 40% response rate in all patients, including patients who were previously irradiated. 
There are upcoming studies of BRF plus MEK inhibitors in combination for brain metastases. So this could also be a paradigm changer in terms of how we address brain disease in BRF mutant melanoma. So the last thing I want to touch upon very briefly in my last 23 seconds is, is okay, well now we've got all these drugs. We've got all these different things we can try. What do you do? There's all these drugs that are approved. There's several things on the horizon. You know, how do you choose what to give patients? Well, the FDA has approved some of the immune therapies to be used after BRF inhibitors in patients with BRF mutant melanoma. So in practice, a lot of us have to use the BRF inhibitors first. Now, I'm not sure all of us believe that's necessarily the best thing for all patients with BRF mutant melanoma, and so there are studies ongoing to try to understand that a little bit better. So here's a picture of the hippo sandwich, and there's a couple different studies. There is a, a big uh, ECOG study where they're, they're sequencing BRAF and MEK inhibitor, dibraf and rutrametinib, followed by ipilimumab and nivolumab, the, the, the most potent uh, immune therapy currently, which is a uh, CTLA-4 antibody and a PD-1 antibody, or the other way around to see which one influences uh, it leads to the best outcomes over time. The other thing is sort of the kitchen sink approach, which is, you know, how do you eat a hippo sandwich? You just open your mouth really, really wide and take everything at the same time. Uh, so there's a study right now ongoing of BRAF plus MEK plus PDL1 antibody, uh, which has just finished a phase one accrual, which will be presented at the ASCO annual meeting in June. So those questions haven't been answered definitively, but the answers are on the horizon. So conclusions, basically the targeted therapies turn off broken growth switches that cause the cancer to grow, and uh, combination therapy can lead to synergy. Also, the, because these therapies are targeted, we can actually look inside the tumor cells before and after treatment to tell what really happened and adjust our therapy accordingly. Surviving cells can adapt to the, to the environment, and so we need to find ways to address that adaptation, and that non-lethal combinations uh, can select for resistance. Resistant tumor cells, in some cases, may not be adapted to a drug-free environment, so intermittent dosing is being explored. Again, not proven. This is not the standard of care, but we're looking into it, and certainly if you have patients for trial, that would be something that could be considered. Um, and uh, basically, our therapies are developing and improving rapidly. We may be able to put some of these into use for adjuvant therapy, depending on pending trials. It's not yet approved standard of care yet. Uh, they appear to have activity against brain metastases. Again, how that fits into the paradigm is still being explored and the optimal sequence of events is still under study. With that, I'll thank you very much for your uh, attention. All right.